Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV, episode number 434 for Tuesday the tw 12th of <laughs> January 2016. I had to think about it. I'm still... I, is this 20... What? 14? 20, Eric Kidd is here? I've missed it's got to be oh, 2014. I've missed You're a late. couple. I've missed a couple. I was early tonight. Normally, you know, the cameras are up. I think we had you scheduled for episode 360-something. Oh, okay. Yeah, and here okay. you are. I, I missed a couple. Eric Kidd, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, folks. He's nice back. back. Sorry. Sorry about your luck, but I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you, man. <laughs> also, we've got uh, Adam up in camera over there. Love the Star Trek shirt. Say hi. That's all he can do, folks. we got to get this guy a, a headset. He's kind of quiet. He is kind of quiet back there. <laughs> Actually, he's making a lot of noise, but he's, he's about a kilometer that way. Uh, we've all got right. a really powerful lens. And MangoFox70 is over there, and she is working away in the chat room, making sure you stay in line. Get on to Category 5 on Freenode if you'd like to say hi. Uh, Eric. Tonight, we are celebrating 20 years of the GNU Image Manipulation Program. That is, uh, we're continuing our 20 weeks of GIMP tips. And this is number eight, I believe. Tis. I missed the first Week eight. seven. Yeah. You got some catching up to do, man. I've got some serious explaining to do. So have you missed me or has it been all right for We've you? We've missed you like crazy. We're going to talk all about it. I've got a whole bunch of great stuff coming up for you tonight. We are going to be jumping back into our series about Raspberry Pi. That's this little server that we've got here. I love here. pie. Oh. I love pie. Flight of the Concords reference every time. Uh, okay, the Raspberry Pi server, we tried to install MariaDB last week and failed miserably. And we're going to see if we can get that resolved tonight. Also, uh, we're going to check on the protection that we installed, that CSF LFD firewall, and see how that's working for us. And did you know that your Linux computer actually has a very powerful task scheduler? I did not know that. We're going to be taking a look at cron jobs this evening on Category 5 Technology TV. I knew that. What do you got coming up in the news? <laughs> Here's what's coming up in the Category 5 uh, TV newsroom. Google has banished several apps after finding out uh, they were making unauthorized downloads and fake reviews in Google Play. Online video is about to get a lot more colorful as YouTube joins the likes of Netflix and Amazon with HDR video. And Lumosity's brain training games deceived customers. Microsoft has revealed details about the data it is tracking via its new operating system, Windows 10. And a father in Pembroke, Ontario, is warning parents of kids with Xboxes after his 17-year-old ran up a credit card bill, don't laugh, Eric, it's not funny, of more than $8,000. Stick around, the full details are coming up later in the show. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Starring Sasha Dermatis. Hilary Rumble. Eric Kidd. And your host, Robbie Ferguson. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Welcome to the show. I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I am Eric Kidd. Feels like it was just yesterday, right? It says here I'm Sasha Dermatis, but... Where does it say she's, that? She's way better oh. looking and more charming than I. No, <laughs> the teleprompter <laughs> needs some updating, but uh, you're doing well with it, anyways. It's it's great to see you. Yeah. Yes, we have missed you, not just myself and the the crew here, but uh, viewers have been very excited yeah, to have you back. I'm seeing some familiar names in the uh, chat room, and I'm seeing some names I haven't seen before. So uh, a lot of uh, new viewers and a lot new of folks, a lot of people who have been here for a long time. Yeah. Nice to have you here. Eric, uh, we got to start the show. Uh, what have you been up to? Uh, what's uh, you know? There, there's this gap. Is it just black to you? Like, do you do you know what happened during the the past two years, or it just uh, I don't know. Just kind of disappeared. Show, off? Alias, where uh, you know she disappeared for a couple of years and it was complete. No, it's nothing like nothing that. Like I've that? been. Uh, okay. I have a guitar in my hands every single day. I've been playing gigs all over the place. That's great. Um, and we we talked when you were on the air yeah. about the hope that that would happen for you. I have been uh, doing all kinds of gigs, everything from pub gigs, which is a regular staple, to um, 
couple, two or three uh, seniors' homes a week, which is, I, it's it's one of the greatest places to play. I've got, They've got. I've got folks who are genuinely happy to see me. I really enjoy uh, the interaction. I have a repertoire that works. They actually think you're Gordon Lightfoot. They actually think that. And speaking of Gordon Lightfoot, who is you know longtime hero of mine, I uh, was contracted by uh, with my dearest uh, pal uh, Steve Ayers uh, to uh, work with Classic Albums Live. We really? recreated the Sundown album and wow. did a bunch of uh, Gord's other gold tunes, and we did a concert up uh, in Aurelia at the uh, Aurelia Opera House. Uh, I was great. I oh, had that's some fantastic. fabulous musicians working with me. I had so were you singing as well as playing? I, I was the lead singer for uh, great. probably ninety percent of the tunes and uh, played lead guitar, rhythm guitar, and it was. Uh, an exciting, exciting time. We got to get you playing a song on the show again at some some point in the near right. future. I don't see a guitar here, folks. I did not bring Sorry. a guitar tonight, but uh, I uh, maybe I'll bring out a new original tune or something. That would be wonderful. Yeah, teach me the the harmony, and I'll uh, I'll lay down some some vocal melodies for you. Something for you to Maybe. dread or to look forward to, depending we, on your perspective. We don't know. You'll you'll just have to see. You'll just have to see. <laughs> Well, like I say, nice to have you here. Uh, we've missed you over the past couple of years since we. Uh, this is your first yeah. time sitting in uh, a co-host position uh, uh, since we moved into Studio D. Absolutely, the so first time here. I was here once. You had some uh, hors d'oeuvre and some yeah. uh, snacks. We had kind of around. like a an opening and, and a, a Google Plus Hangout, uh, which is available on our Roku right. channel if you want to watch it. Back. That's right. There were folks on that monitor over That's there, right. and we were saying hi. Yeah. Um, Agamotto was uh, wondering, uh, so I'm doing gigs, still playing hockey, not very well. I uh, hurt myself a bunch of times. Actually, the worst injury came at uh, co-ed three-pitch Sunday evening. Those ladies recreational there. Recreational baseball, and uh, somebody ran me at second base. Yeah. And, uh, oh, yes, lots Dangerous. of gigs. and Oh, and beer. Lots of beer. That's part of the pub and that's, gig. That's, that's, that's part, part of the, of the pub, pub gig. gig. It's part of the hockey thing. It's part of the softball thing. It's... Uh, <laughs> Sounds like you've been having fun. The Pixel Shadow is uh, now has had its third episode. We mentioned Mango Fox Seventy is here. She's in the chat room, and uh, you can go to YouTube and do a quick search for the hashtag The Pixel Shadow to see her new show, uh, which is available for you uh, through the Category Five TV network. And uh, nice to have you folks uh, participating in that. Saw Dennis Kelly there uh playing the game and uh and running around hopefully you'll make it onto the screen sometime soon Ooh. let's see your phone i see you got a new phone since we last well, saw each other yeah no i've dropped a few things on it but yeah i've got a, a, a samsung. samsung s5 i was thinking you'd be proud of me buddy oh my good yes you have a blackberry wow i've been i've been seeing they have a new what is it the priv i don't know this is a z10 anyways that somebody gave me and uh it's canadian or american is it a Z10 or a Z10? I would say, did I? what did I say? You said Z. Wouldn't I? No, you wouldn't. You're Canadian. Oh, because of Club Z? No, because we're Canadian. Do we say Z now? We say, we've always said Z. Yeah, like you say kilometer? Kilo. Kil- kilometer. Kilogram. Okay, we're going to do this right here, right now. <laughs> what are we doing? Snowmobile. 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 I could say mobile. Mobile phone. Yes. Snowmobile? No, no, no. Certain things you do certain ways. Certain things, like certain kilometer. Things. Now, if you're following the rules of the English language, and, and, and we have folks from all over the planet here, um, you know, and you'll listen to CBC late at night, and, and there are certain words that are said a certain way, and that's the way you say it here. And Eric this, Kidd always says it right. However... The third last syllable of a word is typically the one that gets the, uh, the emphasis, or the emphasis, if you... So you'll hear the controversy on late night radio, and they'll say controversy, which is correct along with the rules of the English language, but not common. That doesn't sound right. doesn't sound right. Yeah. So kilometer is correct. Kilometer, I've lost that fight. The American media, it's kilometer. It's probably never Thank you, American media. Yeah, I, Finally, I think, I you did something you know, useful. <laughs> it, you know, kilometer sounds like something you would measure distance with, like a thermometer. You wouldn't say thermometer. No, you wouldn't. And you wouldn't say kilometer. Unless you were you measuring. You say thermometer, right. kilometer. No. 
Yeah. yeah. A kilometer is a distance. A How are we still a, arguing about for, this? <laughs> you just proved my measure. point. You wouldn't say thermometer. Because it's... Neither would you say kilometer. Because it's a device for measuring temperature. How about measuring distance or speed? Right. So we might say kilometer to measure the distance of how many kilometers we drove. But I've lost that fight. I've, I'm, I'm admitting that I've lost that fight. Thank you. You um, heard it if, here. If you check Eric out Kidd for... has lost the fight. <laughs> like a bad game of baseball. <sighs> Did I show you which finger I heard it? No, I'm not going to show you which <laughs> finger I heard it baseball. <laughs> Hey, if you love Category 5 TV, we've got oh, the whole network. Oh, how could you not love Category how could you 5 not? TV? <laughs> Especially tonight. Did I mention Eric Kidd is back? Um, if you love Category 5, we've got some great shows. As I mentioned, we've got uh, The Pixel Shadow has just started up. We've got a lot of great shows starting up first quarter 2016 and all the stuff that you already know and love. Uh, if you love us, please show us that love. All you need to do is send us a 25-cent piece. For every episode that we do, you can go over to patreon.com slash category five. It's called Power in Numbers, folks. Uh, if you could just capture that vision and throw us a quarter every time we do uh, our weekly show. So that's 25 cents a week. It adds up because we do have a lot of viewers. And, uh, and if e enough of you would catch the vision, I mean, we're talking, what, 125 people giving $2 an episode. $2 an episode is a lot. So let's True. break it down and say instead, let's take, what is it, a thousand people at 25 cents an episode and our rent would be paid. The heat that is keeping us warm tonight would Oof. be paid for. The lights that are, and as you can see, And we could send you a little picture of a starving geek show host to put on your refrigerator. A bald nerd. <laughs> <laughs> So we appreciate I've everybody who's captured the vision so far. Patreon.com slash Category 5. And please, if you uh, would consider taking that on yourself as well. It's not a lot on an individual basis, but it's going to help us in the, in the long term uh, with keeping Category 5 TV strong in 2016. So thank you, everybody. We should do a little episode on the English language because English is... I think we just did. It is a tough language. We could wrap it up it and is, it's done. English can be learned. It's tough, learned. Though, though through thorough thought, can be learned. Sorry, I'm not even going to touch on the O-U-G-H thing. It is a strange language. I'll it it gets confusing. Oh, <laughs> Agamotto, calm down. <laughs> um, Borski, um, Borski, um, Bork, Bork. Are you reading that? I'm reading that. You are. Agamotto, I would like a couple of whatever he has ingested. Well, <laughs> when you're posting things like that, it's really nice that Eric is so active in the chat room and able to Sorry, I can't type these and talk and right? walk and <laughs> drink coffee all at the same time. You're you, Kelsey tonight. I'm Kelsey tonight. I messed up the notes. There you go, Eric. But, okay. Category five I is... I was Sasha earlier. Yep, Sasha, Kelsey. I'm not I used to having this I guy around. Kelsey? I don't know that you have. Hi, Kelsey. You really should. There. She's awesome. Awesome. Well, so Sasha. I was Sasha earlier today. <laughs> well, what is this little guy here? This is a teeny drone, and you were asking me about this before the show. Oh, my gosh. Not to spend too much time on uh, Patreon, but we are giving away two of these to the same person. So all you have to do is support us, and you could win <laughs> two of these. So you can race a friend. So you and I could race, man. Wow. I could see the cat jumping out of the air and just giving that thing a smack. Oh, yeah. And then he'd be like, <laughs> oh, I'm kind of nervous, and I don't want them in my coffee. It's all that, good. That's, that's pretty cool. That's a teeny drone. Cat5.tv slash teeny drones if you want to check them out. But uh, we are giving away a couple of those to uh, viewers who support us <laughs> through a draw at patreon.com slash category5. I was All hinting right. there. It's your Sorry, turn, you it's know your turn on the, on the to-do list. On the to-do list. Well, let's see. Where am I? You're going to show me the phone. Yeah, uh, Kelsey. I'm Kelsey. Well, you know what? Category 5. <laughs> <laughs> that is the there's something about this tag that we have to do. It's it's in our contract, yeah. but we have to do it and yet it's always the most difficult moment of the entire hour. And I am always like uh by the way, got to say that, got to say that. Nudge, nudge. Doesn't Quit matter who it is. Kicking me under the table. Doesn't Robin. matter who it is. Category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, 
it's here. Cat5.tv slash TPN and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Cat5.tv slash IAIB. How was that? Well Fantastic. done, Kelsey. That was perfect. Okay. All right, let's get into it. Uh, we've got, uh, you brought some pictures tonight. I, uh, yeah, I, I brought a couple of, two or three pictures. We're looking at the GIMP GNU Image Manipulation Program. It's a free image editor. You can get it at GIMP.org. And tonight, what are we doing? We, we've got some pictures. You want to put together some kind of a promo poster? Well, you this? know, I was thinking it's a free image manipulation program. I might talk you into making a free image <laughs> promo type uh, <laughs> shot for me. Now so you know how I got them on the show, my, folks. Uh, I'd like a free shot designed for my posters. My my uh, my daughter's uh, sweetie, Alex uh, Cyprian, uh, took a few pictures and great, and uh, we stole them off his Mac. Looks, right. looks like he and, uh, uh, he knows what he's doing. Uh, I see that there are NEF files which are raw file format, so uh, we, we don't have the JPEGs. Oh. I'm not sure if NEF can be opened with GIMP directly. Let's give it a try Let's and see if it, see if it crashes out. Mm. That would be, nope. well, we've got Darktable if it doesn't, uh, and we can always render them down as JPEG. Does GIMP open raw files? Now, it's brought up a raw photo loader, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so I'm just going to leave everything as as is and hit OK and see what what comes up here, see what it does. Did it do anything? It. Uh, there it is. Hey. Colorization is a little, real wonky, uh, but this is a raw image, so a I'm sure you could. The there. Yeah, you could tweak it and uh, make some changes. I'm not familiar with that, but I'm going to, if I may, I'm going to set these aside, and we'll use this for a future promo on oh, uh, a demonstration on how to do color correction as we load those images into the GIMP. Let's just try opening it one more time and see what these options are. Camera white balance. Okay. That might that might be all it is. Automatic let's see. White balance. Automatic Very white simple. balance? Four color. Let's try. How let's about the four color interpolation. Why don't we try camera white balance first just okay. in case the camera actually embedded some information about the white balance because you could see that it was off there and we were getting a real green tone from your lights. There it is. There. It actually looks great. So I didn't even need Darktable as an interim step, and GIMP was able to open it up. But keep in mind, if you get the colors wrong, white balance is where it's at. All right. Because that's telling... So the camera has said, yeah, that drape behind you, that's white, is basically what it's saying, or whatever. It's it wasn't found, actually white, I don't think. It's it was, found yeah, white. I think it was and, ecru. Does anybody really know what ecru is? Is it, is it ecru it or ecru? E-C-R-U, ecru. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. Thanks for clarifying you know that. what? All right, but I've got this picture in there. It looks great. So there's a couple steps that we need to start with, Eric. Uh, so first of all, let's hit Control-Alt-L, and you'll know that I set that up in a previous instance of 20 Weeks of GIMP Tips, so you want to make sure you watch from episode one all the way through okay. till now, episode number eight. Uh, but basically, that is a hotkey to bring up levels that I have configured okay. because it reminds me of how of, Photoshop Yeah, Photoshop works. is Control-L, isn't it? Control-Alt-L. Oh, Control-Alt. But on Linux, it typically locks your screen. So we went through and showed how to change that behavior. Uh, if you don't have that hotkey set up, you can simply right click on the image, go uh, colors, and then levels, and it brings up the same tool. All right. So levels works by, okay, this is the highlights on the right hand side there. See that triangle that is moving back and forth on the I right? The one in the middle is going to move automatically uh, kind of on a proportional level. Um, and I'm going to just move that to where the <coughs> curve, that's where the curve kind of starts. I want to avoid that spike there because that is a, uh, a basically a highlight spike. So basically a glare from your, uh, from the, the lighting from that you my, have. No, yeah, we have from that problem. Okay, we sorry. deal with that. <laughs> All right, and then uh, bring in our shadows. That's the left-hand side. And if you know, if you go too far, you're going to see that it gets too dark. Okay, a little okay. dark. So let's instead let's uh, bring that in there. So that's where the shadows actually start. See the curve, the uh, kind of the right. mountain there. Now, in order to make these level, I'm going to grab that middle one and manually bring that in toward the shadows, oh. the left, which oh. is going to brighten up the image, but in such a way, unlike curves, you're not going to be changing the colorization of the image. You're only changing the lighting, the levels. Okay, so we find where we're happy with that, and let's say that that's where we want it. You're probably going to be printing this, and printers 
traditionally are going to be a little bit darker than screens. Oh, okay. So you might want to brighten it up a, a little bit more than uh, if it was for screen use or for a website or something like that. Sometimes you'll even take the image once you've edited it, brighten it up a little bit, then print it, and it'll come out a little bit better with, uh, with nicer highlights. Oh, that's good to know, too. I think that looks pretty good? Sure. You've got a bit of a desaturation effect going on. I've, I've hit OK there to, to save that yeah. change. Uh, it's a little, de uh, little undersaturated. That means that the colors are not very vibrant. Are they red stripes on yeah, your shirt? Yeah, they were a little more red there. Yeah, so I can tell that from the image. And that's a setting uh, as he's taking the picture on the camera. Uh, and you can use that to your advantage because it does, it does have kind of a nice uh, soft tone to it. But let's go into our uh, colors and then hue saturation, and we can, we can increase the saturation if we'd like, uh, which is going to make the colors kind of pop out a little bit better. See how it's, it is getting a little okay, bit yeah. more colorized, see that? But you don't want to overdo it because then it looks like you've got pancake makeup on your face. Um, so I can go that way with saturation if I'd like to increase the saturation, the, the, which is the saturation of the colors. The guitar, you can really see it. Or if I'd like to have a bit of a, an old style effect, I can bring down the saturation and it's going to not create a black and white image, but instead it's just toning down okay. the saturation of the colors. So that's a very simple slider that allows me to really make some cool tweaks to the colorization of the photo without going as extreme as switching to a black and white photo right. or trying to colorize an image where the color data is there because it's a raw image, uh, but um, I, I can use saturation to increase that color data. So let's, let's actually do that. We're going to bring it up a little bit, uh, and it's going to be different per photo. But you see what that's done? Okay. Is it's really brought up the color of the photo. Uh, let's turn off the preview so that you can see the difference. There it is there. Turn back on our preview. I'm not sure if you can see that as well at home. Um, what I'll do is I'll hit OK so it renders. I'm going to zoom in, and then I'm going to hit Control-Z to undo. Oh, that was Control X. <laughs> There's Control Z. So that's back at the original. And then if I redo, watch his face. See how much more color there is there? And the red stripes on your shirt start to pop out a little bit nicer. Okay, so now we've got to work on our cropping. So we're going to, what is the, is this going to be printed at a specific scale or on a specific size piece of you card? Know, or typically uh, it's just a regular eight and a half by 11. Eight and a half by 11. Okay, so let's do that. Um, how do we do that? This is, now we're getting into this. This is kind of an interesting one because we're getting into, okay, we've got levels, we've got saturation, we've got importing raw images. Now we're going to get into proportional cropping, which is something that you're going to have to do if you want something to, that's going to print uh, at the right proportions um, when you print it out. So 8.5 right. by 11, I'm assuming we're going to go 8.5 wide, 11 high. Right. Okay, so it's going to be like a poster print on uh, letter-sized paper. So right-click on your image and go image canvas size and we need to look at our inches and see what it currently is it's 69 by 33333 three, three, three. okay so i want to uh keep that in mind remember that how many I inches there are and i'm going to type in 8.5 width 11 height okay so now it's got this little itty bitty square in the top left hand corner because this is such a huge image see right. so that square would actually crop to your face so now with that entered, I've got my proportions set. So I've said that's what I want it to be proportionally, 8.5 by 11. But I don't necessarily want it to be that scale. So I'm going to turn on the chain link here so that as I change the width, it's going to automatically change the height. Okay. But the ratio with the height will be the same. Exactly. Got so it's it. still going to be 8.5 by 11 if you print it. But the, the higher the number, we know it's 65 inches wide right now. The higher the number, the better it's going to look when you print it because it's going to be higher resolution. So we're not, oh. we're not scaling up. We're actually taking a huge image and scaling it down to 8.5 by 11 by saying, okay, let's We'll take his select. left eye. So we know that it was 65 wide, but that's not going to work because then we're going to have all this space at the bottom. See what happens right. there? So I'm going to, I, I didn't happen to mention or take a note of what the height was. Let's just start playing with numbers. 35, maybe 45. These are inches, okay? Well, yes, that looks pretty, pretty good. Close, yeah. yeah. 
So what I've done there is that is an eight and a half by 11 frame, but I've got this high resolution image in there and I can put Eric on there by dragging. Uh, do you want that a little closer to your head, the crop line? Or Perhaps. do you like, uh, but that's gonna, uh, of course it's proportional, so that is gonna cut off part of the guitar. Yeah, that, so is that good? That's to be expected, I think, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's do that. Um, so let's just change that a little bit. Let's bring it down to 40 and see where that leaves us. There we are, okay. So then if I bring it down, we get this nice tight shot. How do you like that? Yeah, and, and to fit on the eight and a half by 11, you're probably gonna put a border around it so it I feel like, and some printers will add a margin, okay. which you can avoid, but some printers won't print right to the bleeding edge. Right. Um, they may crop it in a little bit yeah, and I might add a little bit of a way. And you might use a, yeah. uh, a home scalpel uh, from, you know, you can get them for home surgery kits or <laughs> yes. scrapbooking uh, as well. They also carry them for scrapbooking. Okay. You can use that and get a nice little cut as well. How to do your how's own that? splenectomy. Yeah, how's that look? So we understand that's a proportional crop to eight and a half by 11. So now that's the same. So if I go image, scale image, and change that to inches, you'll see, wow, that's 30 by 39. Well, if I change that to 8.5, watch what happens to my height when I hit tab, 11. It's exactly proportional, but it's really high resolution. Right. Okay. So we've, we've effectively kept the high resolution. We haven't scaled down. If I look at this in full quality, I'm going to hit one on my keyboard. Look at that. That's how high the resolution is. Nice. So it's pretty, pretty sleek. OK, what's next, Eric? We need uh, a box at the bottom that's going to uh, allow you to write the venue name, right, you know. things like that appearing live at O'Hara's Public House or something. Yeah, and you're just going to write that in with a Sharpie? I might do that. I might mm -hmm. have some of the words that you might want to say, appearing live at, and then write in the video. Oh, yeah, or, yeah, okay. You know. So let's, let's start with your name then. Let's grab a, the text tool, which is right up here. And in the GIMP, you can either click to start typing, or what I prefer to do is grab on the left-hand side and drag to the right-hand side, and that gives me something that I can center into this box. So now I've got a text area, and I can type in Eric kid, which is really, really tiny text on this canvas. Squint. I'm going to have to... Let's see what 200 font does. Well, I'm thinking 400. Uh, 400? <laughs> mm, oh. Nope, not quite. Mm. 300? What have I done? 200. Enter. Enter. Hmm. There's that. 400. Enter. I think what I did is I actually typed 400 into here. You may have. Yeah. Make sure you highlight the right spot, folks. There you go. <laughs> That's a little better. Let's change the color to white uh, for the font. And you see how I, how I do that? There I'm going to highlight, click on the color swatch, change the current color to white, and now your text is white. So changing, changing the font in GIMP, now you can type in the name of the font. You can go over here and, and choose the font. What I like to do with your uh, font tools is click on text and then click on this little A, B button in the bottom right-hand side, and that locks this dialog into a new little window. So now I can choose the first font and then use my down arrow, and it will oh. change the fonts like that. So if I find one that I really like, it's a lot easier because I'm just simply clicking with my keyboard. Well, to take some liberties with the English language, that's more gooder. More gooder? <laughs> See if I can find one real quick, and if you don't have any good fonts installed, you can always uh, add those, find some free font repositories. See if there's one that works for you. I saw a couple of childish looking fonts, those would be appropriate. That would be. Because it's kid. I'm a bit of a kid. Because he's a bit of a kid. Uh, keep going, keep going. Do you see one that stands out to you? There's Come on. One up there, I oh, did you see one that oh, you really liked? I just liked? thought it was interesting. I wanted to see yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Slope, back one. That's probably the one. Yeah. What's going it on It does there? look kind of funky, doesn't oh, it? Except, you know, I certainly do not uh, need a halo over my eyes. But <laughs> <laughs> we can always remove those, but if you like that font. Well, it just, uh, it's kind let's of. Let's use it. Yeah, I mean, you can play with it. All right, let's use it for today. And then we're doing and this in layers it. so it can be changed. This is in layers. So yes. there's your, uh, your next lesson. If you see over here, I can turn on or off the text layer. Perfect. These are the layers that we've created so far. So let's move this around. So what I have to do is I need to be, be very meticulous with my mouse and click on a text area to drag this anywhere that I like 
or uh, something that Eric actually showed me years ago was to use the moving tool, single click on the canvas, and then you can use the keyboard or the shift yeah. up and down buttons to move things around. Yeah, I think when you hold the shift, it goes a little It goes faster. Farther. Yeah, a lot farther. All right, so is it farther or further? In this actually, case, it would further. be farther. Cause farther? Because it, it actually is distance we're talking, as See opposed what? to the extent. See what you've been missing moving. all this time? <laughs> I was waiting for you to actually step in and correct me. Okay, let's uh, create another new layer Kinda here. Nice. What I've done is I've created a marquee rectangle where we're going to put your uh, box that you're going to... Yeah, and if you can cover up the belly a little bit... Yeah, you think that'll help? The, you know, the head stock of the guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do like the idea that it says it's a Martin. But no. I created a new <laughs> layer, and I'm going to go edit, fill with background color because it's white okay. is my background color. And now that is over top of my text. I'm going to bring that text down here. And now uh, let's position that text so that it is a little bit higher than it is right now, but overlapping just ever so slightly. Does that okay. work? And then uh, what we can do is right click on that and let's throw a drop shadow on our text notice um, not to move too quickly i don't mean to but i did reorder the layers so that eric kid is above the white layer that we added otherwise it's going to be below and it won't show up the right. shadow that we're the shadow would be all for naught yeah so i right click and go filters i've got eric kid's name highlighted right now that's the layer that i'm working on i'm going to go drop shadow and we can try some of these things. I want to turn off allow resizing because we don't want to lose our proportions. We know this is a hugely high resolution image, so our offset may have to be a little higher than usual. Right. So uh, we may need to do something like, I'm not even sure. May, let's try 50 by 50. So that's uh, X and Y axis and our blur, let's try 25. That's really high because this is a high resolution image. Let's see what that does. A little bit too far, right. a little bit too far. So it looks like it's kind of Actually, hovering can you up. Stop there for a second. I it's sure can. Fem Keklaver, F E M K E K. -E -K. Yes, that's the name of the font. Fem, Fem, Fem Keklaver. That's uh, somebody was wondering what the name of the font was. There you go. I'll bring it up on the screen for you, just so that you have it. Uh, there it is. And this is a, a Linux for, uh, installation. So that was Joel N N H. Who wanted to know that? Thanks, Joel. So yeah, now, so now that I've done that, good. I've got it too far. Yeah. Now, do I undo? Now you've gone too far. I've gone too far once again. Do I undo and try new numbers? Nah, let's not bother. I do like the fuzziness of it. It's yeah. not overly fuzzy. It's not underly fuzzy. I like making up words when Eric's on the show. So what I'm going to do instead is click on my drop shadow layer, and I can, in fact, move the drop shadow. So let's zoom in, and let's use the keyboard again to... Uh, whoop, I clicked by accident. Use the keyboard to move my drop shadow. Oh. So I'm up, 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 left, 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 up, 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 left, 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 There we go. Look at him go. Okay. Now that's cool. So now we start to get this kind of a cool effect. We're not going to get into too much of what is possible here. Now I could do something such as, okay, let's let's take it one step further, Eric, if I may. I see the yellow grid pattern around your name. Mm -hmm. That means that's the extent of that layer. So if I add any effects, it's going to happen within that grid. Gotcha. So it's, it's going to um, not take place on the whole image. And you can try adding some effects now, and you'll see what I mean. But what I want to do is I want to go layer. Oh, not on my... I'm still on the shadow layer. Let's zoom out here so I can highlight Eric Kid. Right-click and go layer, and layer to image size. So now I can do things to this layer outside of that area because oh. the yellow grid is on the outside here oh, okay. okay so now with that layer selected i'm going to use my magic wand tool up here fuzzy select tool and click single click and what that's going to do is it's going to highlight outside of your name okay, oh, okay. and then i'm going to right click and i'm going to go uh, select invert which is now selected your name and then i'm going to right click again and go select grow and we're going to grow that selection by let's do 50 pixels so now we have this outline of your name floating around there it's just a marquee what am i up to what are you up to Robbie let's Ferguson? go back now let's go back now to our white layer that we created here for you to write on and let's see what happens if i hit control x 
Ah. Oh. Yeah? Pretty sneaky. Now that's a real cheap and dirty way to get that kind of bubble effect around your, your lettering. Yeah. And this, this font may not be the best for that effect because you want no, something that has nice clean of... edges. Uh, but this one is going to have kind of rough edges. The way it is with chalk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so let's now right click and go select none and we'll really be able to see that effect. So it's actually cut into that white area that's there. That's very cool. All right. Now we could have done a rounded rectangle. That may be, it may have been a, a better idea when it came to that white area. Um, I could always clean that up now by just simply deleting part of it by highlighting my rectangle again and, and then right clicking and go select rounded rectangle. And we remember that uh, we're working with a fairly large image, right. but this particular tool uses percentages. So oh. we can do, say, 25% rounding, and it's going to be the same for any size image because that's how it is. Right. So uh, now select invert. So now what I've done is I've now, I'm not selecting the white area. I've selected everything but the white area, but held on to that rounded edge that I've created on that marquee. So if I hit Control X, which is cut, it has now cr uh, cropped out any of the white area that's outside of the original marquee with that rounded edge. So if I deselect, now you see I've got this beautiful Very rounded cool. edge. Okay, so we've got that, and now you've got something that you can print. It comes out in eight, eight and a half by eleven, and uh, you're good to go. What do you think? Is that what we're looking for? That's that's very cool. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. The GNU image manipulation program is absolutely free. You can download it at GIMP.org. I know that's the first thing you're going to download when you get home tonight. You know, I've I've used GIMP before. Yeah. Uh, but not for a while, and. Uh, I don't think it was version 2.8 that I was using. Right, and now they've got a pre-release cool. of 2.9 available. 3.0 is in the works. It's going to wow. be sweet, folks. Um, very cool. All right, I'm going to just quickly save that for you, Eric, just so that you've got a copy of that well, file. You. And uh, I'll also include that image for you uh, in the show notes of episode number 434. You know what I was thinking? What are you thinking? I was thinking. It's perilously close to... Uh, Time to start talking about news. It is. It's it is. Tuesday, January 12th, 2016, and here are the stories we're covering this week. Google has banished several apps after finding out they were making unauthorized downloads and fake reviews in Google Play. Online video is about to get a lot more colorful as YouTube joins the likes of Netflix and Amazon with HDR video. Lumosity's brain training games deceived customers. And Microsoft has revealed details about the data it is tracking via its new operating system, Windows 10. And a father in Pembroke, Ontario, is warning parents of kids with Xboxes after his 17-year-old ran up a credit card bill of more than $8,000. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. You've got mad skills. Now hone them. Learn new skills or improve your existing ones with online video tutorials and training from lynda.com through our special link at cat5.tv slash lynda. Learn software, technology, creative, and business skills that you can use today to help you achieve your professional goals. Join today and start learning. We'll give you this chance to try it absolutely free with unlimited access to all of the courses. Sign up now for free, cat5.tv slash linda. I'm Eric Kidd, and here are the top stories from Category5.tv Newsroom. Google has banished 13 Android apps from its Play marketplace after security researchers found the apps made unauthorized downloads and attempted to gain root privileges that allowed them to survive factory resets. One of the 13 apps, which was known as Honeycomb, has had as many as 1 million downloads before it was removed, according to research from researchers from Lookout, the mobile security provider that spotted the malicious entries. They said the explanation for the app's hundreds of thousands of downloads is the malware itself. First off, some of the apps are fully functioning games. Some are highly rated because they are fun to play. Mischievously, though, the apps are capable of using compromised devices to download and positively um, review other ma malicious apps in the Play Store by the same authors. 
This helps increase the download figures in the Play Store. Specifically, it attempts to detect if a device is rooted and, if so, copies several files to the slash system partition in an effort to ensure persistence even after a complete factory reset. The best option for removing these malicious uh, data... I saw what happened there. <laughs> it's tricky. It's tricky. I, uh, I think I hit a key on that. Anyway, yeah, so. The, the, uh, the um, first step is to, uh, to uh, catching this is uh, to back up any data worth keeping and then reflash the ROM supplied by the device maker. As always, people should remain cautious and alert when downloading Android apps and be aware that even when apps have been admitted to Google Play and receive a large number of positive reviews, there's no guarantee that they can be trusted. With big-name TV makers and movie studios all pledging to support high dynamic range or HDR technology, it was only a matter of time until the world's biggest online video platform got in on the action, according to Mashable, YouTube's chief business uh, officer. Uh, confirmed the uh, service will soon roll out support for HDR, allowing streamers to watch videos in a lot more detail. While HDR has become a buzzword, it is likely to make a big difference to the way you watch TV and movies this year. In brief terms, HDR captures a wider range of contrast and brightness. The resulting images show greater detail in darker parts of the screen and highlights a wider range of colors, allowing you to pick out the details that you may not have noticed before. What it does mean, though, is that you will need a compatible TV or display to view YouTube's range of HDR videos the way they're meant to be viewed. LG, Sony, and Vizio will soon release the new 4K sets with high dynamic range support built in, and PC makers are following the trend. Netflix and Amazon are on board, too, ensuring that streamers can also board the HDR bandwagon. Is that ever interesting? Are you familiar with HDR technology or I have imagery? I've only or? seen it on my Rogers uh, email saying that yeah. you know I can. Oh, it's coming! I can sign up or for it. There? Oh, and, really? Yeah. HDR is basically you saw the tool that we were using levels. How I was able to bring up the brightness yeah. of the whole scene and it really improves things. Well, HDR takes typically three images and they're different exposures. So where Adam, for example, has us right now at an exposure um, so that you can see our faces really well, but behind me, things are a little bit darker. So what HDR would do is it would brighten up the background and keep us also bright, and, and it really makes it so that you can see all the depth of the image and usually uses the three exposures, but I wonder how they're going to do that for video. I know that there are ways to emulate it, but how do you possibly get three different exposures on the same lens. That is going to be something. That's, for, you know, my mind is not thinking about how do I watch it. My mind is thinking, how do you produce <laughs> how do you that? Yeah. How do you create that? Still, sure, because you use a tripod, you hit three different exposures, and then you merge them together, and you get an HDR image. But that's really interesting. I'd be maybe, eager maybe to see what it looks like. lenses. <laughs> but then they wouldn't be lined up. Yeah, They'd have to be so precisely lined up to be able to shoot like that. I don't know. And if I had three lenses, I'd be shooting in like 3D. You only need two lenses for 3D, and 3D is better. <laughs> Although HDR 3D, <laughs> now you're talking. Uh, the company behind brain training game Lumosity has agreed to pay $2 million to settle false marketing claims. Lumos Labs has said its games helped users perform better at work and even alleviated the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. But the U.S. Federal Trade Commission alleged it did not have scientific evidence to back up the claims. The company must now contact all of its customers to offer them a chance to cancel their subscriptions. Launched in 2007, Lumosity consists of 40 online games purportedly designed to train specific areas of the brain. In advertising, it claimed using the games for 10 to 15 minutes three or four times a week could help users achieve their full potential in every aspect of life. Make me a better news reporter. It also said the games could alleviate the symptoms of dementia, stroke, 
and brain injuries. But the FTC's Bureau of Consumer Protection Director, Jessica Rich, said Lumosity preyed on consumers' fears about age-related cognitive decline. The games had been widely promoted through TV and radio ads on networks including CNN, the History Channel, and Fox News. The FTC says Lumos has also failed to disclose that some consumer testimonials on its website had been solicited through contests that promised prizes, including a free iPad. The FTC had wanted to fine Lumos Labs $50 million, but said it was accepting the smaller sum of $2 million because of the company's financial condition. The company must also... Uh, offer customers an easy way to cancel their subscriptions, which ranged from $15 to $300. In January last year, the company said it had 70 million members worldwide. Wow. Microsoft has revealed details about the data it is tracking via its new operating system, Windows 10. In a blog, the firm listed statistics on how many minutes had been spent by users in total in the Edge browser and the number of photographs which had been viewed in the photo app. The firm also said that Windows 10 was now active on over 200 million devices. However, some people have questioned whether the data tracking is a threat to privacy. Since Windows 10 was launched, Microsoft has been tracking information about how those with the OS are using it. Until now, though, relatively little has been known about what data are being collected. Security expert prof Alan Woodward told the BBC he was interested to know the long-term plans for the data. This information may be collected for one purpose, but how long it will be stored and what else they're going to use it for uh, is unknown. As soon as it goes outside the country, it's no longer protected by things like the country's data protection laws, and it is not clear where data relating to Windows 10 is transmitted and stored. All right. A father in Pembroke, Ontario, is holding up his latest credit card bill as a warning for parents whose children have Xboxes. Lance Perkins says he was shocked to learn he was on the hook for money after his 17-year-old son racked up thousands of dollars in online gaming charges. The cost first appeared on an earlier credit card bill, but Perkins says he didn't originally notice them. By the time the next bill arrived, the total amount owing had grown to $8,800 with interest. Xbox charges annual fees so that gamers can access multiplayer games online. There are also separate fees to purchase games, additions, and extensions. But Perkins says the business scheme is misleading, especially for a young person without a credit card of their own. Xbox does offer tips for parents to avoid unauthorized purchases by children. The console recommends creating separate Xbox accounts for each user and making a password for signing in and making purchases. And if children want to buy games on their own, the gaming system recommends parents purchase a gift card for their child rather than providing access to their credit card linked accounts. Good advice. Big thanks this week to Jeff Weston, Roy W. Nash, and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us. If you found a news story you'd like to send, uh, like to send, email it to newsroom at category5.tv. For all your tech news with a slight Linux bias, visit the category5.tv newsroom at newsroom.category5.tv. For the category5.tv newsroom, I'm Eric Kidd. Thanks, Eric. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and uh, welcome to the show. You can find us online, www.category5.tv. I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Eric Kidd. Eric, uh, guest 4008 is uh, in the chat room and saying, Why do they track my data? It's a paid software, not a free software, actually. This is part of it. Windows 10, they offer it for free. Oh, it's yes. It's free. Uh, okay, he wants to know, uh, well, says, first of all, they should not do it. Robbie F., is data tracked in Linux also? All right, first off, they I should not. data was the guy's name from Star Trek. No, that's data, data Dr. Pulaski. Data Come the on. actual bits and bytes, you know. No, nah, it's the other way around. You got it backwards, no, man. No, data are these little I'm bits. sorry, guest 4008. We're digressing. Okay, Not sure. we. Not we. I was totally on track. Um, okay. Nice name, guest 4008. Well, look, they haven't 
they haven't added n- a nickname yet. Okay. Nice, nice handle, Earthling. They should not do it. Here's the thing. Microsoft's frame of mind is Facebook's doing it. Google's doing it. All the big names are doing it. Shepherd's why are we not why are we not making money off data or data? Either. Both. Both. Why not take both? Why are we not collecting our users' information and user uh, uh, trends and what they do with their computers and using that as a monetization platform? Because everyone else is doing it. So, hey, let's bring out Windows 10. It's free. And uh, let's collect that data. But why I do think that, the, that? We, well, why aren't we? <laughs> we use Google Ads. So I guess somebody is. That's what helps pay the bills. Maybe one day if, if enough patrons join us on yes. Patreon, we can cut those out of the website. But truth is, all the big companies do this because data is a commodity these days. It's a currency, really. Um, so you, you, you hope that you can trust these people. Does Linux do it? Linux is an open source platform, so we know what's under the hood of Linux. If anyone wants to, they can download the source code, they can read it, and they can figure out what it does. They can see what happens and uh, make sure that it's to their liking, if you wanted to, because it's open source. uh, You could read it as a a plain text file. Um, So it has happened where someone has tried to inject some tracking code into or malicious code of some other sort into the kernel. And what happens is, is within a very short amount of time, sometimes hours, um, people catch on to this addition and say, whoa, somebody tried to inject that, reject that update. So it, it has been tried. As far as I know, it hasn't been successful. Um, but I mean, you could always install a program on your computer, if it comes from you know a less than reputable uh, software developer, they could do it. The websites that you're looking at could be tracking you, um, but it's it's a tough call, right? It's a tough call. But Linux, in uh, specifically, uh, it is uh, it was said that um, I think it was Linus Torvald's dad who said that he was approached um, to add code um, that would allow. The, the certain powers that be in the United States to be able to track the user data in Linux, and they had rejected that. So it was publicly known that they said no. Uh, that said, in Korea, uh, they've got the, uh, the operating system there that is based on Linux. We talked about it a couple weeks mm-hmm. ago, and it is tracking users' data. But it's Linux, right? So it really depends on who creates the flavor and releases it. Uh, if you download some hacker version of Linux, well, then it's possible. Maybe they put something in there that could be doing something that is untoward. Because it's shady in the first place, perhaps. Right. And, and no reputable company would ever muck with software that would do something never. that was illegal. It would never happen. What kind of car do you drive? I drive a Toyota. <laughs> Does okay. that count? Yeah. No, I just thought maybe you good? had a, a German vehicle. Um Oh, and I do like Nate UK. Hey, Nate UK. Love Nate UK. He's Nate awesome. Nate UK is great, and he confirms that it is data, and so is the oh. guy from Star Trek. You're lucky you're such a good guy. <laughs> he is the guy from Star Trek. We already established that. Yes. Okay, can I get back onto our Raspberry Pi? Well, I know can we're, you? Are may, you asking permission May I please? Okay, okay. So. Eric, the, he actually proofread the news tonight and sent me the proof revisions that were so incredibly anal retentive. Well, there was another one there, you know, but I wasn't sure. It was in quotes, so I thought maybe it was a quote because... It was a quote, yeah. You know, it was... Uh, they ended it, uh, you know, the sentence with four, and I was thinking, no... Uh, so for we which we were that? using the data, oh, yes. not uh, what I'm it glad, was. I'm the glad we were able for. to fix that in time but, uh, for the show. Well, I did point out that data by nature, the word is plural, so the data are. <laughs> this is the stuff I go through, folks, just to get them to read the news. That's the behind the scenes. So yeah. you know that. Okay. There you have it. Still want to be friends? Yeah, I do. Yeah. 
<laughs> we have a lot of fun. Okay, this is the Raspberry Pi server that uh, we've created on the show. Uh, Did I get a fork? Episode number 428, we actually put it together. The Cat Pie case, which is a, the uh, design of this case, which is made of a piece of cardstock, uh, and you can print it on your own printer. That was episode number 429. It's lovely. It's pretty cool. Um, and uh, last week, episode number 433, we started uh, by deploying our PHP server, and, uh, and we also tried to install MySQL MariaDB and unfortunately failed. So we're going to try to get through that tonight. But the other thing that I installed, deployed last week was a tool called CSF LFD. It's a firewall that I love on my Linux servers. It monitors the login forms all across the board. LFD monitors the, uh, what is that? Login form daemon. I don't know what it stands for, but it's something about login forms. But it, So when I tried to SSH into the Raspberry Pi today. I forgot that we changed the password. And a couple times I put in Raspberry as my password and I got locked out. So it works. So let's take a look at how that works. Let's jump onto our Pi, which uh, incidentally now has a new IP address because I locked myself out and I had to uh, <laughs> get in there. All right. SSH uh, Pi at 192.168.0.110. Notice how that's changed. And let's see if I got it right. Yes, I did. All right. Raspberry. Did I type it right? Ras. Oh, I can't type. R I do like the way you're pronouncing raspberry, though. E R R Y 1. I say raspberry because I want you, that's the, the viewers way it's supposed to. to be pronounced. Oh, is it? I just want to be. <laughs> I want to make sure that you know that I am typing raspberry, not okay. raspberry. Okay, so there, I am in. I entered the right password this time. But let's go into sla uh, sl Oh, I can't do go there yet. We learned this last week. I need to super user, become root. And we did that by adding a password for the root user. So now I can go etc csf. Now, uh, nano csf.deny, which is the file that grabs IP addresses of bad people. And you'll see now I've commented it out. I remoted in and commented myself out because I, uh, I was locked out. So Oops. my IP address, of course, is 192.168.0.3. And you'll see failed SSH login. And so I was actually denied access to this server from then on. So I had to remote in. I had to download Putty on another machine that was Windows-based and remote into the Pi and comment that out. And then CSF-R to re reload the definitions. Okay, so first of all, one of the things I want to do, I mentioned it last week, but let's actually do it now. Nano csf.allow, and you'll see I am still in etc slash csf. So that's the actual location of the file. So now let's actually add 192, the 192 block as an allowed IP address, so 192.168.0.0 slash 24. And what that does is it says any IP address on 192.168.0. whatever is going to be allowed. I can go control O to save and then control X to exit and then CSF dash R. That's the command and that reloads all of my rules. There it goes. So now any internal IP address, even if I guess the wrong password over and over again, theoretically, I'm not going to get blocked. Uh -huh. Always a good idea. Now, you can put in an actual IP address. So if this is a remotely accessible server, you can put in your home IP address, and then you will not get blocked, gotcha. which is a lot safer. If it's WAN-based, publicly accessible, you don't want to do a, a span of IP addresses because it might not be you. It could be someone else. Right. This is my computer and every other computer on my network because it's in this block. Okay, so now CSF is restarted, and you can see I'm connected. So let's jump back to where we were last week. I'm going to go apt get install. And what did I do? No, I'm going to go back to uh, the Pi user because I was sudo apt get install MariaDB dash server. And when I hit enter, what happens? Oh, it depends on this, that, and this, and unable to correct the problems you, you have held, held broken. broken packages. Broken packages. For, if I had a nickel for every time I held broken packages. Canada Post. Canada Post. All right. What we're going to do now, I made a mis Well, not a mistake, but what has happened here is that the Raspbian OS is based on Debian Jesse, but 
the repositories for MariaDB that we added through the MariaDB website, I showed you how to do that on episode 433, are in fact not going to work on the Raspbian OS. So let's undo what I did there. So let's go sudo nano slash etc apt sources.list, and you'll see that I added the MariaDB repositories. I'm simply going to comment those out, or you can hit control K to delete, and then hit control O. And Just then hit you. enter, and it writes the file. Control X, and then apt get, no, sudo, because I'm not root right now. Sudo apt get update, and it's going to reload your repository information from the sources.list file. So now that MariaDB repository, which I had added last week, thinking, hey, that's what I do on a Debian system, but maybe not on a Pi. Okay. This time we're going to be able to get MariaDB. No broken uh, packages. Hopefully. Uh, but we're going to grab it from the Raspbian repositories, which are already configured. So hopefully that uh, that works. Are you good to go a little bit over time? Are you good to go a little bit over time, Adam? Good? Uh, we got nods? How about you at home? Are you okay if we just push this a little bit over the edge of 8 o'clock? I'm okay with that. Over the Raspberry edge. That's it. Here we go. Reading package lists. <laughs> My pronunciation is it's immaculate. Lovely. This evening. At least you didn't say pronunciation. Okay. All right. Pseudo. No, you know what I'm going to do? I'm not even going to do that. I'm just going to, I'm going to use control R, which is reverse eye search. Uh, pseudo and then control R again. Control R again. There it is. I'm going to use the exact same command that I had used previously before removing those repositories. Let's hit enter and see what happens differently. <gasps> It's got some packages, and it's asking me, are you sure you want to do it? 120 megs. Let's try it. Yes. Downloading MariaDB. No broken ones? <laughs> well, no broken ones thus far, yeah. uh, but they are down coming. So those are being downloaded to our Raspberry Pi now. MariaDB is going to automatically be activated. Here, it's asking us, all right, it's time. We've got MariaDB. What do you want your root user password to be. So this is this is root. That means this user has access to everything. Everything. Make sure this is strong and make sure it's something that nobody else is going to be able to grasp at, but you need to be able to remember it. This is the super user password. Enter it again and then hit enter and that's going to configure that as my root user. Look at that. If MariaDB dash server does not install for you for some reason on your Pi, you can always install uh, MySQL dash server. The commands that we're, that we're going to use are going to be exactly the same. MariaDB is basically a fork of MySQL. So it's MySQL, but then somebody else has taken over and said, okay, we can do some things better. And they have optimized it and made it faster and, and done some other great things to MySQL to make uh, a really great uh, alternative to the MySQL package. But if you don't have MariaDB in your repositories, MySQL-server will work. Oh, okay. All right. So that's installing for us. Next week, we're going to look at um, actually setting up a MySQL database on MariaDB and uh, creating our first user and then activating a website that's going to be database-driven as well. Uh, but tonight, uh, that's all the time that I have for this feature. But I did promise Al Peck that we're going to look at cron jobs really, really quick. Okay. Still good? Still good. Fantastic. And just in case something you found here was useful, you know, we're, we're, we're not above little shameless self-promotion. So if you found something here useful, you could consider throwing a little something in the tip jar at donate.category5.tv. And we'll you certainly do appreciate that. Robbie to put on your fridge. <laughs> cron tab is a tool that is going to allow you to edit what's called a cron job. And uh, cron jobs are scheduled tasks in Linux. Think of your task schedule in, in Windows or being able to set up um, uh, scripts to run at designated times. So in your terminal, all we need to do as whichever user you want the task to run as, so I'm running as Robbie right now, uh, you could become super user if you want them to run as root, or you could do sudo and then crontab-e, but we're going to run as Robbie, so I'm going to go crontab-e, and that brings up my cron job editor 
which right now, if I scroll down to the bottom, I have no cron jobs set up. These are scheduled tasks. You'll see this little sample here that tells you, hey, this is what you want to do, but what does it actually mean? Okay, M means uh, minute. H means hour. D-O-M means day of month. M-O-N means month. And D-O-W means day of week. So that's like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So uh, minute, let's say zero. Hour, let's say three. What do you think that means? We're going to run a cron at... Three in the morning. Three o'clock in the morning. Exactly. Day of month. Do we want to run this on, a, on the first of the month? On the tenth of the month? Oh, let's so go that with the fourteenth. Or do we run this at three o'clock every day? Every day. All right. Uh, of which month? Every month. I want to run this every day. I don't want to just run this in December. Maybe I do. Let's run this every day of every month at 3 o'clock a.m. So then the day of the week is kind of redundant. You're not going to... No, not necessarily, because I might say I want to run this... Well, but yeah, and it overrides. Every day, yeah. Yeah, day of week. Every day of the month and every day of the week. But you could say uh, only on Tuesdays. Oh, so, okay. Right, okay. so I could say, so Sunday every being... Every day of the month, but only on Tuesdays. So. Sunday being zero... Uh, so Monday would be one and Tuesday would be two. So right. I could do that and say, okay, this is going to run uh, every day of every month at 3 a.m., but only on Tuesdays. Mm. Uh, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. It just doesn't... If you were writing a math equation, it would be a little uh, awkward. Yeah. 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 It's or, not math. Yeah. It's cron. Okay. Now, what are you going to do? That said, uh, I'm... Okay. Three in the morning every day. Of what the are month, we gonna do? We're gonna go slash Tuesday. whatever home Robbie. Make sure I have access to this folder, and then maybe I have a folder called scripts and index files.sh, and that's my script that's going to run uh, at 3 a.m. every day on Tuesdays or every day. Okay, or we can say divided by. Let's go here. Divided by. No on minutes divided by 10 so now we've said star divided by 10 on 3 a.m so every 10 minutes so it checks every minute divided by 10 at 3 a.m and i've created a cron job now that is going to run index files dot sh at 3 a.m at 310 at 320 at 330 at 340 at 350 and then be done until oh, the next day okay so at four It'll At stop. four, it will not run right. because okay. it's not a part of that three hour, which is designated in my okay. uh, cron. So look up cron job, uh, and uh, you can find some wonderful uh, tutorials online. And uh, look up cron tab as well, which is a tool which may, may not come with your Linux computer, but it's basically a really nice, easy way to edit using your default text editor in Linux, be it VI or Nano. I'm using Nano here on my system. Uh, and that allows you to edit those cron jobs. So now, once I've done that, I save that cron job in Nano. It's Control O, as we've learned. Uh, in VI, it would be colon W, and then colon Q. Uh, in Nano, it's Control O, and then Control X. You'll see that the next thing it does is it says installing new cron tab, and that means that task is now running in the background. Every time you reboot your computer, it's going to uh, remember those settings. So that's a real simple, quick, nitty-gritty tutorial on cron tab, and we're going to look at cron jobs a little more as we uh, as we learn how to do set up backups on our Pi server and uh, things like that further on in the in the series. All the time we have, my friend. We've had enough, have you? I think they've had enough of us. I think they've had enough of us. Before we run out of hard drive space, saving these HD videos direct to disc. Oh, yeah. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. Thank him for being here. Uh, you're going to be back. That was a statement, not a question. And uh, you have a fantastic week. I'll talk to you again next Tuesday night. See ya. We hope you enjoyed the show. Category 5 TV broadcasts live from Barrie, Ontario, Canada every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you're watching this on demand or through cable TV, check out the local showtimes in your area at Category5.tv and find out when you can watch live and interact in the community chat room. Category 5 is a production of Prodigy Digital Solutions and is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 Canada. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.